And good evening, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. Welcome to tonight's Grace Study Hour webinar. I am your host, Charles Smoot, author of Fallen from Grace, Understanding the Theology of Grace, the Dangers of Legalism, and the Three Phases of Apostasy, which is now available in our second edition at Amazon.com in either paperback or Kindle version. We are offering a discount right now, so hurry on over to Amazon and pick up your very own copy today. Ladies and gentlemen, we are excited about uh, tonight's webinar. We are introducing you to part six of the book, Fallen from Grace, as we are in the home stretch of finishing the book. And tonight's webinar will be the first of two as we start chapter 17 and we're going to be talking about the grace factor. The Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians in his second epistle says, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Second Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10. You know, my brothers and sisters, it is one thing to write about something you have read about, but not experienced. It is quite another to write about something you have experienced firsthand. And so I come to you tonight not as one on the outside who is looking in, but as one who has personally been restored through the sovereign grace of God. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, God's grace is not an ideal we strive for or something that we vaguely preach about. But grace is something we must all experience each and every day on this journey. Eventually, we may realize that without God's grace, we would soon perish in our own corruption, hopelessness, and despair. Fresh grace. Matthew 6, 11 reads, Give us this day our daily bread. A parallel passage is found in Luke chapter 11 and verse 3. Give us day by day 
our daily bread. And again, 2 Corinthians 12, verses 8 and 9. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. In John 6.51, Jesus said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. You know, my brothers and sisters, in many ways, grace is like manna. Manna was the bread of heaven that sustained the children of Israel 40 years in the wilderness. You see, essentially, God wanted Israel to know that they would have to depend upon his goodness, his mercy, and his provision on a day-by-day -day basis. And to ensure this, God gave them a daily lesson or a daily reminder. He miraculously supplied them with only enough manna to sustain them for one day. Before a Sabbath, they could gather twice as much. But if they tried to store the manna, it bred worms and stank. You see, each person gathered according to his own appetite as much as he or she required. The manna was fresh and it was supplied each day. And so grace is to the New Testament believer what the manna was to the Old Testament believer. We receive grace daily. We receive grace freely. And we receive grace sufficiently. When Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread, could he have been alluding to the manna the children of Israel freely received from God? He who met all of their needs in the wilderness? As the manna was new every morning, each day the believer is supplied with fresh grace, a grace that is sufficient to sustain him through all of his needs. And so, ladies and gentlemen, when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, it is a cry for fresh grace, without which we cannot be sustained. Interestingly, however, the believer does not have to work for it or earn it. It, the grace of God, like the manna, is free. Grace is not something we deserve. The believer is simply encouraged to believe, to ask, and to receive Mercy, forgiveness, divine enablement, and strength to walk in our gifts and calling flow freely from the throne of grace to the believer. You see, God equips the believer through his grace. And so, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, to have God's grace is to have the power of Christ rest upon the believer. 
You see, ladies and gentlemen, we can only experience this power resting on us in fullness as we acknowledge our weakness and our utter dependence upon him. You see, for each of us are made of clay. Each of us, ladies and gentlemen, in our own way, experience weakness, infirmity. And so we must acknowledge our own shortcomings and our own inadequacies and our utter dependence upon him. Let's talk about grace and ministry. 1 Corinthians 15, 10, Paul writes, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Romans 11.29 reads, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. And so I would like to address briefly the question of grace and ministry. You see, there are some in the body of Christ who believe in performance-based ministry. This is the belief that God bestows gifts, callings, blessings, favor, and ministry based on human merit and the believer's works or performance. I would like you to consider two questions I have asked myself. One, does God choose a man or woman for service based on their works of human merit or based on his grace? And two, does God give gifts, callings, or supernatural endowment based on human merit, works, or based on his grace? You see, Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. But to hear some people preach, you would think that God made a mistake when he called the following men, Abraham, who was a liar, Moses, who was a murderer, and David, an adulterer and a murderer. That's just to mention a few. Although God mightily used these men, they were not perfect from a moral or legal standpoint. They bore false witness, killed, coveted another man's wife, and committed adultery. However, God did not qualify them as prophets or leaders based on their individual merit. Furthermore, he did not disqualify them because of their failures. Nevertheless, God used them in spite of their shortcomings. In fact, from what I have seen and heard in recent years, I doubt that they would be card-carrying preachers in some circles today. It is therefore evident to me that all New Testament ministry is a result of God's grace. You see, regardless of the function, whether fivefold ministry gifts, body ministry or service gifts, 
or the nine spiritual gifts, they are all gifts. Charisma and are bestowed by the grace of God. Therefore, I cannot endorse the legalism of performance-based theology and ministry. You see, one cannot earn by human merit a gift of ministry any more than one can earn by human merit the gift of salvation. You see, God does not give gifts to the church because we are holy, obedient, spiritual, or based on merit. That, ladies and gentlemen, is why they are called gifts. We may indeed be holy, spiritual, and may indeed have done righteous works. However, it is important that we understand that believers do not and cannot deserve gifts from God of any kind based on our own righteousness, obedience, good works, or performance. You see, God bestows his gifts and calling based purely on his love, his grace, and according to his good pleasure and eternal purposes. These operate through faith, and he asks that we use them responsibly and that we live responsibly. Furthermore, According to the Apostle Paul, and contrary to modern thought and practice, these gifts and callings are irrevocable. Romans 11.29 says, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, when God bestows his gifts and calling upon an individual, he does not change his mind. That is through grace, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, when God places a divine call on a believer's life, he does not change his mind. However, a reasonable question may be asked. How does a person's character and reputation affect his gifts and calling? A person's character and reputation may affect his effectiveness and fruitfulness, but the gifts and callings of God are not revoked. Therefore, grace-based ministry is a difficult principle for the legalist to understand and accept. This is because the legalist believes in performance-based theology and ministry. However, it is possible that someone will have a special call upon his or her life, great spiritual gifting, and powerful anointing, even though privately he or she may be struggling with sin. You see, the reason why God continues to bless and honor the gifts and calling on their lives and ministry is not because they can preach, produce results, or otherwise perform. It is because the gifts and calling are not based on human merit, but upon God's grace, his love, and eternal purposes. However, you can be assured that the Holy Spirit will convict and deal with this individual to bring him or her to a place of repentance as with any other believer. Let's talk about legalism and ministry. You see, the legalist believes that God will only bless and anoint the ministry gifts of those who maintain a certain standard of personal righteousness. 
Furthermore, the legalist believes that God will remove his anointing and revoke the gifts and calling of those who do not. This seems reasonable to the legalist. However, the legalist is forgetting that God did not bestow his gifts and callings through human merit in the first place. You see, there are at least seven Greek words that are translated as gift or gifts in the New Testament. The fivefold ministry gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher are gifts, or in the Greek, dama, or presence to the church. This means that although the fivefold ministry gifts are individual charisma gifts to the servant leader, they are presence, dama, to the church at large. In summary, the gifts and calling, fivefold ministry gifts, body ministry and service gifts, including the nine spiritual gifts, are all a gift of God's grace and have nothing whatsoever to do with the human merit or the performance of the recipient of the gift. And now, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, let us consider the principle of abounding grace. Romans 5, 20, 21 reads, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound that as sin reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Everything that we know about God reveals that he is infinitely holy and hates sin. It is written, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. This scripture promises that God will respond to repentance and faith with mercy, forgiveness, and grace. This work is a message of hope to those who have come short of the glory of God. Perhaps you have wondered why you, or even someone you may know, has struggled with sin and moral failure of some kind. However, after repentance and faith toward God, you then experienced great grace, mercy, and compassion upon your life and ministry. Well, my brother and sister, you have discovered and experienced the principle of abounding grace. Paul writes, But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Romans 5.20 Romans 6, 1 and 2 reads, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You see, ladies and gentlemen, the principle of abounding grace reveals that God's grace abounds to the degree that the power of sin will be broken in our lives and not so that we can keep on sinning however paul is clearly saying that the power of god's grace 
is more powerful than the power of sin. Allow me to illustrate the principle of abounding grace using the physical laws of aerodynamics and motion. You see, these laws or principles govern the flight of an airplane. To put it simply, the law of gravity, identified in our illustration as weight, holds a plane to the ground, as the law of inertia causes the plane to remain at rest. In order for flight to occur, the principle of gravity and inertia must be overcome. You see, to accomplish this, a principle called thrust is provided by the plane's engine, propelling it forward at a speed greater than the law of resistance that is called drag. You see, when the plane and speed or the mass and speed of the aircraft reach a certain threshold, the principle of lift takes over, allowing the air pressure under the wings to be greater than the pressure above it. As the greater laws of thrust and lift overcome the lesser laws of gravity, inertia, and drag, the phenomenon of flight occurs as the plane leaves the ground and soars into the air. It is now free to fly because it has overcome the laws that bound it to the earth. Likewise, my brother, my brothers and sisters, the spiritual laws of sin and death must give way to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Paul writes, Romans 8.2, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. You see, even as the lesser laws of gravity, inertia, and drag cannot overcome the greater laws of thrust and lift, even so, it is impossible for the law or the principle of sin to overcome a true believer's life. <clears throat> you see, due to the principle of abounding grace, the believer is made free. Ella Thuru, which means exempt. And the believer is made to overcome sin through the blood of the Lamb. These spiritual principles, ladies and gentlemen, cannot be refuted. <coughs> Excuse me. The legalist commonly argues that grace theology transforms into license and results in a licentious lifestyle of sin that profanes the things of God. Therefore, anytime someone stands up for the gospel of grace, the legalist bristles with caution and concern. You see, having formerly been a legalist for many years, I know their concern. However, I no longer share it. Why? Because I understand and have experienced the principle and power of abounding 
grace in my own life. <laughs> I've been there and done that. The truth of the matter is, grace does not transform into license. Grace transforms into liberty and freedom. This freedom, however, is not freedom to sin and do as I please. It is simply freedom from the law of sin and death, freedom from the law of Moses, and freedom from the law or principle of righteousness through human merit or works. Just as an airplane experiences the challenges and struggles of the difficult phase from taxi to lift off, believers, due to immaturity in Christ or other reasons, may pass through a phase in life where it appears that sin temporarily increases. This is possible, ladies and gentlemen, depending on the quality of the believer's fellowship with God. Nevertheless, as the believer grows in grace, when the power and principle of abounding grace takes effect, it will transform the believer's life. Regardless of his present state of disobedience, immaturity, or lack of fruitfulness, the principle of abounding grace is stronger than the principle of sin, and it will prevail in the true believer's life. You see, like an airplane, he will reach a threshold in his life when grace no longer allows sin to have dominion or rule in his life. Another important point I want to make as we draw our lesson to a close today is the following. Ladies and gentlemen, there are two things that I want you to remember with regard to law and grace. Number one, ladies and gentlemen, legalism. Legalism breeds self-righteousness spiritual pride, boasting, guilt, despair, fear, intimidation, insecurity, and bondage. And what is legalism? Legalism is any belief system where man derives merit through the keeping of the law or other man-made doctrines, disciplines, or rules in order that he might obtain righteousness with God and thereby secure for himself favor, blessings, and in the end, salvation and eternal life. And the second thing, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand about law and grace is that grace or grace theology or the principle of grace leads the believer to righteousness, humility, faith, hope, love, peace, security, and liberty. You see, ladies and gentlemen, as grace believers, we honor God's word because of the quality of our relationship and not because 
of the intimidation, insecurity, or even the fear of losing our free gift of salvation. So ladies and gentlemen, the legalist has a relationship with God that is based on guilt, fear, intimidation, insecurity, and bondage, while the grace believer has a relationship with God based on faith, hope, love, peace, security, and liberty. In closing, it is my belief that the principle of abounding grace must be firmly established in the heart of the believer if indeed salvation and the security of the believer are to be fully realized, not as a result or work of human merit, but as the result of the finished work of the cross. Father, we thank you for this part one of our two-part series as we approach the home stretch. And we ask, Lord, that this principle, the principle of abounding grace, that we may firmly establish it in our hearts and that we may seek to understand it and let grace let grace be the foundation of our relationship with you and we ask it in Jesus name Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we want to thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar, part one of the Grace Factor. And next week, we're going to bring you part two, which will be the conclusion of our webinar series in the book, Fallen from Grace. Dear friends and guests, this ministry operates on the faith and faithfulness of God's people. If this webinar has been a blessing to you, your gift will help us, help us to reach others with the message of grace and the finished work of the cross. Please visit our website at www.gracestudyhour.org and select the PayPal donation button. We want to thank you for your support. And we want to thank you for your prayers. We're going to leave this up for just a couple of minutes, and then we will take your questions and comments.